Good morning, everybody. I'm going to say welcome to St. Cuthbert's this morning. I'm well aware of the fact that you're all at home and you're not here with us. But we are so glad to be able to worship in our space and for you to be able to share that experience with us. So welcome. This is the first Sunday of our Advent season. So we live in hope as well. And you're going to hear more about that later. But we live in hope that we will be back in this space together incrementally i'm sure small numbers building to large numbers but and regardless it's so good to see you today i want to say a huge thank you to the people who helped us to uh, unload our christmas trees on friday night we had a very large contingent of people to come and help especially a lot of young people and we're really grateful for that i want to say a huge thank you to dave mckay and his family to 
Jeff Bamford and to Anne Harvey Hope, who helped to manage all of our youth who were here. But we had a full lot of trees until yesterday, and we had an amazing run yesterday, our very first day of sales. And so we need lots of volunteers to keep our sales for the next uh, few weeks. Who knows, maybe they'll all be sold out in the next couple of weeks, but we really need help. In fact, if you're hearing this on Sunday, and you can come out to the church this afternoon, we would appreciate your help. But we need help all week during the evening, and we need help next weekend and the weekend after. So we have shifts, and you can help us with those shifts, uh, but we'd really appreciate any help you can give us. We also have our uh, Advent book study that's going on right now, and uh, it's a book written by Richard Rohr called The Wisdom Pattern, and it is uh, introducing the wisdom of Jesus, and we are going to be... in that study for the next four weeks. So if you want to join us starting this Wednesday, please do. Just contact Lori in the office. I can deliver your book, or you can come and pick it up, or you can buy it directly. It's entirely up to you. On uh, Wednesday, we'll be looking at the first three chapters. So please join us if you can. Regardless, we have another book study starting on Epiphany, Wednesday, January 6th, and that will run for five Wednesdays also. And that's going to be studying a book called The Wisdom Jesus, which is basically a follow-on to the book that we're going to be looking at uh, throughout Advent. Again, please let Lori know if you would like to join that. You will register, and we will make sure that you have that uh, link. We do everything virtually via Zoom, so please join us. Um, We have three churches involved right now. We have our own. We have Grace Lutheran, and we have Grace in Waterdown, and we're looking at possibly expanding that to include more churches in Epiphany. So I can guarantee you it will be interesting, it's vibrant, uh, and uh, we're all learning a lot and uh, increasing and enlarging our faith. So please join us if you can. Let us now begin our worship as we do so in prayer. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us continue by praying together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us pray our collect prayer for this first Sunday of Advent. And let's do that praying these words together. Life-giving God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility to be the light of the world, we pray in his name. Amen. We're going to be lighting the Advent wreath now, and so we'll be saying a prayer and then singing together, and because you're at home, you can sing as loud as you like. We're not going to be allowed to sing here, so please sing so we can hear you. Let us begin in prayer. We wait for the coming of Christ, the light of the world. Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus.
true light, which enlightens everyone, is coming into the world. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Christ, Christ shine in, in your, your church, church today. today. We're going to try something new because we're in the season of Advent and we're in the season of anticipation. But I want us all to uh, take some time at this moment to just center ourselves. So find a place to sit comfortably. You can close your eyes if you like. Slow your breathing. Try your best to feel God's presence, to feel the spirit working within you. Try your best to shed out all the things that are happening in your life right now, those things that are probably making your mind race or your heart race. Stop worrying about those things for just a few moments so that you can allow God to be with you in your thoughts. Allow the love of Christ to flow through you fully. now that we have calmed ourselves and prepared ourselves, let us now hear the word of God fully. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived. No eye has seen any God beside you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, taketh away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He was shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim, in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts, show the light. 
light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us a derision of our neighbors, and our enemies left us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance. And we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand. The son of man you have made so strong for yourself. And so will we never turn away from you. Give us strength that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O God of hosts, show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Jesus said, but in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hear the word of St. Paul writing to the Corinthians in his first letter. You are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever you are, would you bow your heads with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So today I'm speaking to you on the first Sunday of Advent. And today's reading from St. Paul, which is chosen for today, speaks of the theme of waiting and preparation, which is the great theme of Advent. And also implicitly, I think, of hope, which is also the great theme of the first Sunday of Advent. So I want to talk a bit about this, but before we do, I think some of you may have a question, which is, who the heck are you? Because you have not seen me before, or most of you have not seen me before, so I wanted to say a few words of introduction, and I want to kind of talk about how 
um, my journey, uh, which is now converging with the journey of the people of St. Cuthbert's, is also connected to some of these themes that I'm going to be talking about for the next, uh, for today and the next three Sundays, the themes of Advent. So let me introduce myself. My name is Alan Hayes, and I am the new honorary assistant priest at St. Cuthbert's. And assistant means that I'm here to kind of help out. And um, I'm particularly uh, helping out uh, Jeff, the rector, because um, I'm licensed uh, to him. And uh, honorary means that I don't get paid for this, which is OK. Uh, honorary assistant priests are often either retired clergy or they are clergy who have their primary appointments somewhere else. And I'm in the latter category, so I teach history of Christianity at uh, Wycliffe College in the Toronto School of Theology, which is how I met Jeff and Sue Ann Ward originally. And then uh, Jeff and I got reconnected. I was honorary assistant at St. Simon's Anglican Church here in Oakville for uh, many years, and Jeff was the assistant curate there for a couple of years as well. And then we've kept in touch, I guess, over the years. Um, so I'm uh, uh, at the Toronto School of Theology and uh, have not really been at St. Cuthbert before. Some of you may know my wife, uh, the Reverend Maura Murray Hayes, who was at Maple Grove United Church for something over 30 years. And um, here's one reason you may uh, know her. Uh, a few years ago, um, she was at uh, Centennial Pool getting our daughter ready to go swimming. And uh, someone, she somehow met someone from St. Cuthbert's and they said, we've really enjoyed uh, hearing you preach. And she said, well, I haven't preached at St. Cuthbert's. And they said, well, you know, your microphone up at Maple Grove United connects with the sound system at St. Cuthbert's. And it turned out that both churches had used the same sound engineer, so uh, everything was compatible. So she was a little embarrassed uh, by that. But, uh, now, in our church tradition, the great theme of Advent especially the first Sunday of Advent, is, is hope. And I don't usually kind of talk too much, too much about myself when I preach, uh, but, um, you know, I'm kind of new to you, and I want to introduce myself a bit, so I will talk about that. And I'm really sorry I don't get to meet you in person with uh, Houses of Worship being closed here. Um, I, I look forward to finding some way to meet you as time goes on, but uh, right now it's going to be a one-way thing where I get to introduce myself, but you don't get to introduce yourselves to me, which is unfair because I'm going to tell you something of my story, and your stories are probably at least as interesting and as important as, as mine, but we'll, we'll start with this. So um, it's going to get to hope, but let me just talk begin with background by saying that I was born in Oakland, California, which gives me something in common with Kamala Harris. And uh, I think it's always important to acknowledge whose territory we are on. So I was born on the traditional territory of the Chitinio people of the Ohlone Nation. And I grew up in a little city of 11,000 people, which had only one church in town. It was an interdenominational Protestant church a little bit Congregationalist, a little bit Methodist, a little bit Presbyterian, and uh, after I left to go to college, it became a little bit Episcopal uh, as well. The church was liberal Protestant in its theological character, um, and it was at a time, you know, I grew up in the 50s, and it was the time when a lot of liberal Protestant churches were strong on American patriotism. So um, not in a harsh way, really, but just in a kind of an accepted uh, Christianity has something to do with living in the United States kind of way. And I didn't get much doctrine, but I did get the beginning of spiritual formation. I learned some Bible passages. I learned some lovely hymns. I learned some um, prayers, learned how to pray, I suppose. And I learned something about what the church is doing in the world. So all of that was, was good, but not much Christian doctrine. Now, I was the third person in my family. Uh, and as you may know, if you've been a third child or have had more than two children, the third child gets away with more than their older brother and sister. And 
that meant that when I was 11 or 12 and I began resisting going to church, my parents no longer had the energy to force me to go to church. So I went into a lapsed situation from the age of 12 to about the age of 18 or 19, which I guess wasn't all bad. But I wasn't learning anything about theology, certainly, until I got into high school. And this is an odd story, I suppose, because going to a public high school in California, you don't really expect to learn theology. But when I got to American literature, my English teacher, Mr. Killian, had the view that you can't really understand English literature unless you can understand all the references to the Bible that literature is just full of, and uh, theological references that historic American literature is just full of. And we started American literature with Puritan literature in New England, and that's definitely full of theology. So he decided he should tell us something about theology. Now, he was an Irish Catholic himself, and he had no uh, particular identification with New England Puritanism, but he was the kind of teacher who thought that his job was to you know, make, make the point of view of an author as persuasive as possible. So he gave us instruction in Puritan theology in a way that would have been worthy of somebody wanting to convert us and all the students in class. There's a lot of things about Puritan theology that are not very attractive and not very uh, intuitive, such as Adam's fall and predestination, and so the students would argue back, and, but he would always have a, a better argument in favor of it. And he began to convince me. I came out of that with seeds of Reformed theology in my soul, and it was enough, maybe not to really convert me, but enough to make me curious about who God was and who I was in God's world and where I could find out more, certainly on a kind of a path, which one might not have expected from a California high school. Now, this was the 1960s. I graduated from high school in 1963, and change was in the air. There was civil rights movement. There was a women's movement beginning. There was uh, American Indian movement, First Nations movements. There was uh, a kind of a reaction against the what people saw as kind of the complacency and maybe a bit of the hypocrisy, is that too strong a term, of the 1950s. And now the people I've known who lived in the 1960s can roughly be divided into two groups. Some really regret all the changes that happened during that decade and some got really excited about them. And I was one of the ones who got really excited about them. I was excited about President Kennedy's new frontier and about civil rights and about internationalism and the Peace Corps and the domestic Peace Corps and the Ich bin ein Berliner that President Kennedy said with his Boston accent in Berlin. It was all, um, it was all heady, you know, for a person my age. And I bought into it. But I remember that when my mother voted for John Kennedy, she said, I sure hope nothing happens to him, but I, I sure wouldn't want to see Lyndon Johnson as president. And at the end of all this road came the assassination of President Kennedy. And like a lot of people my age, probably like you if you're my age, you remember exactly what you were doing when you heard about President Kennedy's assassination. And it was like all my dreams were kind of shattered. You know, the line from... Dover Beach, maybe, by Matthew Arnold about the world that seemed to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new. That's how it seemed before November the 22nd, 1963, and then a lot of those dreams just seemed to get shattered after. Before that date, I was like, a little like William Wordsworth, you know, who went to the French Revolution in its early days and said, Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive and to be young was very heaven. I just felt privileged to be alive in this new frontier. And then afterwards, I wondered what was going to happen. So like pretty much everybody on my college campus, on the night of the assassination, we crowded into a large auditorium and we all prayed together. It was probably the first time I'd prayed since I was 12, you know, in the Sunday school that my parents had let me leave. And I began to realize how much I depended on something 
besides human affairs, besides politics, besides the hopes that we have in uh, present in present things. So Psalm 146, you may know. This is the lesson I learned, I guess, on the night of the assassination. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord their God. So that was kind of a really significant point in my journey, a point when I didn't learn maybe, uh, you know, permanently because I had to kind of relearn it from time to time, but learned that one needs to kind of put their hope in something besides human things. I mean, I keep having to relearn it. Sometimes somebody gets elected as a president or a prime minister that I'm kind of excited about, and I think, oh, yeah, you know, they were campaigning about all the things they're going to do, and now things are going to change. And my experience has been that it doesn't take too long before I get kind of disappointed. So that has happened to me again and again. But I come back to this idea that for all our efforts, for all our hopes in the things of this world, there is only one rock of our salvation, and that is, and that is God. Now, that too is not so easy because God disappoints us. We, we depend on God for things, and sometimes the good suffer, and sometimes the wicked flourish, and sometimes injustice seems to reign, and then we begin to kind of wonder, where is God in all of that? Why doesn't God do something? And I could probably give you some theological answers to that, but they wouldn't be very comforting or very persuasive because in the end, you still kind of wonder, well, but if God is loving and if God is in charge, why doesn't God things make things better? Which brings us to this Advent theme of hope and also to this reading for today, which is about how we are still waiting still waiting for the revealing of Jesus Christ and still waiting in a way to understand the meaning of why we are here. I mean, I think when we are in the middle of our lives, it's hard to see our lives in a way that makes sense in the larger context of things. Um, things happen in our lives that we don't predict. Things will happen in my life that I'm not predicting, so I don't think I have the final perspective on the meaning of my life. So we're still waiting for the revealing of that. We're still waiting for the revealing of Jesus Christ and of the revealing of our meaning. But what we're also doing while we're waiting is we are given these spiritual gifts. That's the lesson from this verse of St. Paul to the Corinthians. He has given us all these spiritual gifts while we wait for the revealing of Jesus Christ. And he's writing to the church at Corinth. He's writing to a church a little like ours at St. Cuthbert's or maybe you're at Grace Church or maybe you're somewhere else. And churches are not perfect communities. Certainly Corinth was a good example of a very imperfect community with many divisions and jealousies and misunderstandings and um, conflicts which Paul had to try to heal. And most, I guess maybe every church has its share of jealousies and conflicts and misunderstandings and divisions and so on. So it's not that it's a perfect place, but it is a place where God pours out this diversity of spiritual gifts on everybody. And these include gifts of encouragement and gifts of prayer and gifts of mutual discernment and gifts of people. Some people have a pastoral heart and some people have a sense of outreach and social justice. And you bring them all together and it's a it's, I mean, I, I feel privileged. I'm always feeling privileged to be a member of a church. I may have times of being unhappy with the church. Uh, I remember the primate Ted Scott used to say, I have a lover's quarrel with the church. And I sometimes feel that there are things that I want to argue against, but I'm still kind of in love with the church because of the spiritual gifts that God pours out onto all of us while we are waiting. So at this point, my journey and your journey begin to converge, and they converge in this theme of hope. Hope and waiting and the sharing of spiritual gifts. And for this privilege of being part of the church, and for
for the challenge of being part of the church and for the gift of hope. Thanks be to God. Let us affirm our faith as we say, we believe in God who is love and who has given the earth to all people. We believe in Jesus Christ who came to heal us and to free us from all forms of oppression. We believe in the Spirit of God who works in and through all who are turned toward the truth. We believe in the community of faith, which is called to be at the service of all people. We believe in God's power to transform and transfigure, fulfilling the promise of a new heaven and a new earth where justice and peace will flourish. Let us continue now praying together our prayers of the people. In joyful expectation, let us pray to our Savior and Redeemer, saying together, Lord Jesus, come soon. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come, come soon. soon. O wisdom, from the mouth of the Most High, you reign over all things to the ends of the earth. Come and teach us how to live. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus come, come soon. O Lord, and head of the house of Israel, you appeared to Moses in the fire of the burning bush, and you gave the law on Sinai. Come with outstretched arm and ransom us. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come, come soon. soon. O branch of Jesse, standing as a sign among the nations, all kings will keep silence before you, and all peoples will summon you to their aid. Come set us free and delay no more. 
Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come soon. O key of David and scepter of the house of Israel, you open and none can shut, you shut and none can open. Come and free the captives from prison. Lord Jesus, come soon. O morning star, splendor of the light eternal and bright sun of righteousness, come and enlighten all who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come soon. O King of the nations, you alone can fulfill their desires. Cornerstone, you make opposing nations one. Come and save the creatures you fashioned from clay. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come, come soon. O Emmanuel, hope of the nations and their Savior, come and save us, Lord our God. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come, come soon. soon. For those who are lonely, sick, hungry, persecuted, or ignored, remembering especially those made known to us, Claire, Nika, Asha, Ella, Elaine, Kathy, Jim, and those to know, known to you at home, that our Lord and King will comfort and sustain them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come, come soon. soon. For a peaceful end and eternal rest to all who are dying, especially those dying without the comfort of their family at hand during this pandemic, and your peace to those who mourn, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus come, come soon. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes all sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that, that we may, may delight, delight in your will and walk, walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May the infinite grace of God have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us continue now with the prayer over our gifts. God of love and power, your, your word stirs within us the expectation of the coming of your Son. Accept all we offer you this day and sustain us with your promise of eternal life. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and to praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. The heavens, the heavens tremble, tremble and, the and the mountains, mountains quake at, at your, your presence. presence. Although we, we have, have forsaken, forsaken you, you, you have, have never, never forgotten, forgotten us. us. You, you are, are the potter and, and we are the clay, the work of your, of your hand. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever say to the glory of your name, Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God, God of, of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. glory. Hosanna, Hosanna in, in the highest. Blessed, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus is, is our, our grace and peace, peace the, the word that, that we proclaim, proclaim, the source of all our strength, and, and the, the giver of, of every good gift. gift. In Christ's body, we have received fellowship with you, our God. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Gracious God, pour your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread, that the bread we break may be the communion of the body of Christ. By your Spirit, Unite us with Christ and with your church and all the world. Keep, Keep us, us awake, awake until, until the, the hour, hour of Christ's, Christ's coming. coming. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, life-giving God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. God of promise, you prepare a banquet for us in your kingdom. Happy, Happy are, are those, those who are, are called to the, the supper of, of the, the Lamb. Lamb. Dear friends, I invite you in this moment, wherever you may be, to receive Christ in communion with the saints and the gathering of God's people, unseen and yet present with us now, many are made one. We receive you, cosmic Christ. We, we welcome, welcome your, your presence, presence in us, and, and together, together proclaim our, our love for you. you. With, with the, the saints, saints we, we worship you. you. With, with the, the angels, we adore you. you. With and your with whole your church, church, we proclaim your reign. Fill, fill us, us with, with the awareness that we are all one, one in you. you. Amen. Amen. Drink this cup. 
Let us pray now our prayer after communion, saying these words together. God, for whom we wait, you have fed us with your spirit. Keep us ever watchful, that we may be ready to stand before the Son of Man. We ask this in the name of Christ the Lord. Amen. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. May our journey in life shine with a star's delight. May our days and our years weave together a wondrous tapestry. May our unfolding story dance with the grace of every blessing. Always and ever may we rest in God. Always and ever may God rest in us. Amen. Amen. Come in peace and leave us alone. 
Let us go in peace to love and serve God's creation. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank <laughs> you. 